Uh, Price started working with Mass Rides as a volunteer um, and is now working as the program manager for Mass Rides. Uh, I'm most impressed with the fact that he rides to work every day. Don't be here. I didn't. I offered you the chance to, but that's a nice <laughs> day, but he didn't ride. Thank you. Price on the whoever is he has in his Just to be clear, I work for Mass Bike, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. It's the statewide bike advocacy organization, and we work in partnership with Mass Rides, which is a, a program of Mass, uh, sorry, Mass Stop. And so they're the sponsors for these classes. What I want to ask is how many people biked or walked to school when you were young? Just out of curiosity. Okay. So I'm 27, and I never biked or walked to school. Well, I never biked to school, and I honestly walked to school. So I was always driven. I don't know uh, off the top of my head, I should, the exact numbers, but basically in the 1960s, there, you can you can help fill me in, but it was something on the order of 60% of kids by to walk to school today, it's, it's more on the order of 12%. So there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of people, uh, number of children biking and walking, and I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir at the moment, um, and at the same time there's been a tremendous spike in childhood obesity, I think it's, um, I think it's a quarter of kids in the United States are obese, and as Mark Fenton, who's a, a pedestrian advocate, but he likes to say, this is the first generation of kids that is going to live shorter lives than their parents in America. And it's entirely attributable to the obesity epidemic. So, so you know, a lot is at stake, even though sometimes, like we were just talking about um, going to Barney Frank, Representative Barney Frank, and he was saying, oh, the world's coming to an end. I guess it was in the midst of the recession. The world's coming to an end, and you want to talk to me about biking. And well, yeah, there are big, big issues in some of the biking and walking. It may not seem like a big deal, but actually the implications are really huge. And I'm just talking about one, this one, one instance. So, um, right, so we have a lot of PE teachers, which is great. I know that um, kids need to get much more PE than they do, and that there's under, there's constant pressure to increase the amount of time teaching in cast material. And I don't, it's PE a part of the in cast sort of. I didn't think so, so there's a lot of pressure on, on physical education, unfortunately. Um, so what, our, our program, I go into roughly 20 schools, but not I. My instructors, I, I, um, I fill, in, uh, fill in the gaps. So my instructors go into about 20 schools per year and teach about 2,500 students these 45 minute sessions. So it's a really quick, like, teach 300 kids in one day in these 45 minute blocks, just one after another, to give you a sense of, of what our curriculum is like. There are other curricula out there which are much more comprehensive and they last much longer. And actually, I think that's a much better model because you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that, oh, when you put a helmet on, it should be like this, and then I'm going to spend five minutes on it, and I'm going to move on to the next thing. As opposed to if you have you know, four weeks, five weeks, something like that, which you guys hopefully have the luxury of doing that as opposed to when we come in for one day. Um, you, can, you can really spend a lot more time and get the, get the kids to actually put on helmets. I know some schools actually have a fleet of bicycles. How many schools here have sort of bikes for the kids um, that are on deck? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just saying if we have money here, you know, uh, we get tricycles at school and rotate them from school to school and teach the kids how to ride a tricycle and we could buy so many and rotate them from school to right. school. We could get them interested in riding tricycles, and maybe that will build them up to riding bikes. Because we're an urban area, and, and we get a lot of hills, and it's tough for kids riding bikes. But to get them interested, if we could get tricycles in school and rotate them from school, to school so won't be so expensive. Then we could start maybe kids get more interested in biking. That's that's a great. I know the Boston Bikes program does that with a fleet of bicycles. Huh. That's a great idea. Um, so part of Actually, I'll start at the I'll start at the beginning, uh, which is always a good place to start. Uh, but uh, I'll start at the beginning with the, the caveat of this is a 40-minute session, and I would love for you guys to expand it out to something bigger than that. Um, this is literally a bare bones sort of foundation for for bike safety, uh, which we adapted from the uh, Bicycle Coalition of Maine, which uh, I'm not sure how they developed their curriculum, but. Um, so we start out, I actually don't start by, <laughs> so I don't start by talking about um, bike safety, because bike safety, I don't know, when you guys think of bike safety, you probably think of the super commuter wearing the, wearing the, the neon, well, I'm not going to talk about bike safety, I'm going to talk about bike driving, which, uh, that's a term that is sometimes used 
uh, especially there's a school stuff called vehicular cycling. But I like to say bike driving because driving conjures sort of like a car commercial going around like hilly curves in a in a convertible or something. You know, driving. So you're bike driving to a, to a you know. 12 year old, 14 year old, that's a, that's a pretty cool image, at least cooler than the, the very responsible and safe. I wear one of these every day when I bike, but as a, in terms of engaging, because you guys know much better than I do that um, keeping his attention can be difficult. And so I say, well, I'm going to talk about bike driving. And then I actually go into, and I'm going to ask you guys these same questions, because I didn't know this until I started doing these classes. Start talking about. Um, all right, so I go into, basically I want to start by talking about the importance of the brain, because that's, that's sort of, um, if I lose these kids in five minutes, and you guys understand this even better than I do, but if I lose these kids in five minutes, which is a strong possibility, and the older they get, the stronger that possibility becomes. It's amazing teaching uh, 10 year olds and then teaching 14 year olds like back to back, because you're just like, whoa, the angstiness and um, loss of attention is just so, so apparent. Um, so I start by talking about, especially younger kids, but early kids, just asking, you know, who here has a pet? Who here has a fluffy pet that they love to, you know, like run their fingers through their fur? And everybody's got a pet, you know, got a cat named Fluffy, or actually, how many of you guys have dogs? Okay, what, what kind of dog do you have? Golden Retriever. Nice, nice. Two of them. Oh, double trouble. Double trouble. <laughs> right, and then what kind of, what kind of dog? A beagle. A beagle, nice. I have a greyhound, and greyhounds are very lazy dogs, contrary to what you might have thought. So I uh, talk about that, and then um, I ask, you know, who here likes uh, likes eating ice cream? Does anybody like anybody not like eating ice cream? Right. So interesting fact: Boston, which I know we're not in Boston, but among major metropolitan areas, Bostonians eat more ice cream per capita than any city in the country. Which is funny because it's a really cold place. I don't know why that would be. Uh, then, you know, depending on the age, um, I'll, I'll ask, you know, like, do you guys want to, is it okay if I ask kind of a gross question? You know, I really like being able to go to the bathroom and not have a parent come with me, which I, you know, when you're really little, a parent has to come with you. You know, everybody here, you guys probably like also being able to go to the bathroom by yourselves, right? Everybody, of course, says yes. And anyway, the point being that being able to love your pet, being able to taste ice cream, being able to be independent, Go to the bathroom by yourself, do all sorts of things by yourself, crucially depends on the brain. So my wife uh, worked in a cognitive science lab and I got to hear all sorts of interesting presentations about the brain, which is actually very fortunate because when I get to talk about the brain to 10 to 14 year olds, oh, and yourselves. Um, does anybody here know the consistency of a brain? What a brain feels like? You popped a brain out of a skull. Anybody have any guesses? What it feels like? Sponge. Sponge. I was going to say, you guys are worse than my 14-year-olds. <laughs> Jell yeah, so it feels like warm butter. So it, just thinking about this really crucially important organ that doesn't, it doesn't heal in the same way that any other part of your body heals. It, it's, it's like warm butter. Uh, you know, if you think of pushing your, you know, the butter that's been on the stove for a day. So um, that's why actually... And I wanna, I wanna preface, I'll start talking about when there's a crash and you're like jerky. So like think if you're in a car crash and you fly forward and then you fly back, what's happening inside your skull is your brain is lurching forward. It's actually um, getting cut up against your nasal cavity and then it's rebounding backwards. And so the, the frontal lobe, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the, the frontal lobe, but if anybody wants to shout out what it does, Temperament. It's self-control. It's your it, the frontal lobe is the part of your brain that tells the rest of your brain, hold on a second, we're not just going to seek pleasure and avoid pain. You know, it's telling it's telling the rest of your brain, like, no, we live in a civilized society. So, people who have who have frontal uh, frontal head injuries, you'll find that they cuss a lot. Um, they they have a hard time with speech sometimes. Except, well. It just depends on the, the part of the brain that was hurt. Also, the back of the brain, because it rebounds backwards. The back of the brain, people have a hard time to see. And the really important thing that I want to drive home, and, and you know, the older the kids get, I might go a little bit more into sort of, this is what happens if you don't wear this you know, wonderful piece of equipment called the helmet. I, al I always want to balance that with another interesting fact, that there was a longitudinal study done in um, the Netherlands 
where they were looking at uh, uh, the sort of overall, you know, all things considered, the, the danger of biking um, versus the health benefits, you know, what's, what's the impact? And I think it was uh, two to five years of increased life for those who bike versus those who don't. So keeping everything in mind about, you know, you are more vulnerable when you're on the road, just the, the increase in, uh, you know, cardiopulmonary uh, health and, uh, and um, well, I guess that's the big one, you know, uh, decreased obesity, these are all going to lead to a longer, healthier life, even counting the sort of like gruesome things that you can also say about, you know, it's really important to protect your brain. And I personally feel, you know, for young people, having a, having a head injury, a brain injury, I mean, that's, that's for your life. I mean, that's, there are decades and decades of your life ahead of you, as opposed to somebody that's older. It just makes it that much, that much more important to stress it. So, right, so I'll talk about, um, you know, I want to say biking is really fun. I'll always ask, how many, do you guys have a sense of, well, actually, I know this, 100% of the, of the students in, in Fall River, or was it in this elementary? participated in the um, bike squad, uh, bike walk. Okay. Oh, yeah. nice. And that was bike or walk? Yeah, that's just walk. Yeah. Just, oh, just walk. Okay. okay, well, how do you have a sense if any of your students bike to school? Is there, because I saw one of those, still. I, I went to the, the World War II Memorial, and it was like, when did I go to San Francisco? I don't, it was kind of, kind of crazy. Did, so, um, I just want to shout out, how many people have kids who, who bike to school? Anyone? Yeah? I'm at the middle school. Oh, uh, okay. Not a lot, but we do have like a handful. Okay. What we've found generally, because uh, we distribute surveys, and of course we, we talk to people. Oh, and I just want to be sure I need to wrap this up by five. Is that right? Okay. I just want to double check. Um, I'll save, I'll save a few minutes for questions or for getting out early. I've covered everything. Um, Right. Well, what I found is that a lot of the students, they, uh, the, a lot of them bike with their friends. Boys are actually more likely to bike than girls, even at this young age. That's something that we're finding in, in our surveys, which actually carries through um, into adults, probably even more pronounced in adults. You, you find much, much more, uh, much higher rates of biking among men than women. But, um, but yeah, so I always like to start with, you know, who here bikes and why do you like to bike? Because that's that's so important. I mean, I bike. Actually, do we have any bicyclists here? People who bike frequently? Anyone? I should have asked. Okay. We have a few. All right, nice. Why do you guys bike? <laughs> I'll ask you. I won't tell you. Anyone? Why do you bike? As an alternative Okay. Okay. So recreationally or community? Oh, local. Both? Okay. So for help? Yeah, Okay. Anyone? Who else raised their hand? Somebody else did. You, sir. Most of my Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Okay. Six year old. Okay, nice. And, and uh, I guess a six year old, is that a trail along or is it not his own bike? His own bike. Okay, and they make the, the full six miles? Nice. Very nice. Okay, so. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I like to underscore that, that, you know, biking is a lot of fun. That's why I work at a bike advocacy organization. That's why, you know, that's why I devote not only my working hours, but I realized just the other day that even, like, if somebody asks, what's your hobby, I can only answer biking. So <laughs> I guess I have a, a single cog. I'm a single speed mind. Um, so, yeah, I'm really, I'm really underscoring to the students, you know, if you're going to talk about bike safety and you're going to talk about some, some of the... Um, I think it's unavoidable that you touch on some of the scarier things that might turn students off to bikes, but really emphasizing that biking is, is uh, fun, it's safe if you do it right, you know, it gives you this sense of independence. That's a really, that's a really important thing that, that we found uh, is, is just crucially important because as I started this presentation with, you know, the health of our kids is at stake, which I know I'm preaching to the choir on that one. So I, uh, I like to talk a little bit about the importance of the brain, and that's how I start out. Oh, and by the way, this is the more detailed curriculum, and I'm happy, Marsha, I sent you a copy, I'm happy to forward this on, it's a little bit longer, so I didn't bring um, printed copies, it just goes a little bit more into detail, and, um, and I can give you a card or something after, afterwards if you'd like a copy. Um, 
so then I go into, well, the brain's really important. You're going, actually, <laughs> what's the fastest that you've ever heard of anybody going on a bike? Fastest speed. Anybody? 65 miles an hour is what I heard. Somebody who had a computer on their bike and it was a 15% grade going down a mountain. And he was like, yeah, it's going 65 miles an hour. And I'm just like, whoa, how? But it's actually, I, I've heard people getting pulled over for getting speeding tickets on bikes when they're, when they're going downhill. So, you know, it's easy on a flat if you have a tailwind to go 25 or 30 miles an hour, which is something that I have done. So you can be going pretty quickly, and you know the question is, how do you protect this, you know, super soft, super vulnerable, extraordinarily important part of your body? Ah, uh, the helmet. You know, Dr. von Helmet invented this because he was trying to think of it. So then, this is where we get into the beef. I know I spent about 10 minutes talking, uh, you know, doing intro and talking about the importance of the brain. Um, Depending on how much time you have, I actually, I think talking about the importance of the brain and the helmet is the most important part, so I try and spend about 15 minutes just, you know, underscoring, emphasizing. Um, oh no, I realize I brought the wrong slideshow. Okay, well it's nothing. I, I have these slides that say eyes, ears, and mouth, and it's, it's not, yeah. Do you ever go into a conversation with kids about why, if they don't like why, why is that? Because I know when I was a kid, everyone had a bike. Everyone had a bike. Right. You used to bike all day long. What happens? Why is that? You know, I I talk to adults about <laughs> about that. I don't talk to the uh, the kids as much. Does anybody have ideas? I'm thinking this is like parents being afraid of their child children's safety, not just accidents, but getting taken anything like that. Unfortunately, that's the day you live in where we're vigilant about it. It's a good reason. Mm -hmm. Any other? Uh, uh, you know, for the younger kids, I'll get to say, you know, what are these, and what do they do, and, and actually, interestingly, you can bring it back to the brain and say, this part of the brain controls your eyes, and the, the visual input is actually switched, so you're actually seeing, a, your, your eyes are, are uh, projecting a mirror image of what you're seeing. But anyway, I, uh, so I start out talking about eyes, and I say the first, the important thing about your eyes is when you look up, you should be able to see the tip of your helmet. If you have a visor, it's even it's even easier. But you know, some people have their helmets on kind of like this. Or I've seen some people, not when there's this crown cup, but some people uh, will will actually have their helmets on backwards, which I mean I guess you can wear a baseball cap backwards, but um, it doesn't look quite as cool. Uh, and if you have any of those cool skateboard helmets, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Nutcase or burn? Uh, I like to talk about personal. I have one instructor. He's awesome. He's like spray painted it and like put stickers on and like zip tied a light to the back, so it's really cool looking, and it you know protects his brain just the same as you know, I mean spray paint. If anything, it adds a little layer. So I talk about how important it is to see because then, well, then I can walk into a wall and I don't hit my nose. So transferring that to if I were biking and I were to go over the handlebars and face plant, the, the helmet, the front of the helmet is actually going to absorb, maybe not all, but more of that impact, uh, which is very important, as all of you know, to a, especially once you get into the 13, 14 age range, um, looks become so hyper important. And so I like to say, yeah, keep that pretty face, you know, just be sure you can see the tip of that helmet. Uh, so eyes, ears, this is, Pretty simple, but you just want to have it be around your ears. Uh, I say, you know, ears let you hear, let you listen, but they have another function, which is they keep your helmet on your head. If you were to go flying, then your helmet stays on your head, and your ears are helping to keep it down. And of course, mouth, it's really kind of chin, but eyes, ears, mouth just has a really good ring to it, where I ask, uh, you know, who here likes <coughs> big burritos? I eat big burritos from Qdoba. I'm like, you know, what do you have to do to eat? I have to go, ah, you know, pretend you're eating your, like, favorite big food. And so that, when you do that, you should be able, you should feel, you should feel the, uh, actually, this is a little loose. I love doing this presentation because then I realize that my own helmet needs to be adjusted. Uh, you should feel the helmet come down a little bit. And of course you want to balance that with, uh, with comfort. Another way of doing it is, 
uh, the rule of two fingers, where two fingers between your eyebrow and the tip of the helmet, and then two fingers between the chin and the, uh, and the strap. And now it might even be too tight. But anyway, the point is you want it nice and secure on there. So the last thing that I talk about with the helmets, and again, I do spend the most time on, on helmet use, is trying to make it cool. I know like this helmet is not that cool. It's got a sticker on the side. These are actually reflective. It's pretty cool. Um, and, but you know, beyond that, it's not the most fashionable. It's no nutcase helmet. It's not spray painted, so you can't make it much cooler. But uh, I do kind of bring it home because, I mean, I know this does bring up a little bit of heartbreak, but who here is a Patriots fan? We didn't go all the way this year, but I mean, I imagine that we have a few Patriots fans. They all wear helmets. Big, burly football players who take poundings, they still wear helmets because they know that their brain is really fragile. And, you know, you can talk about, my last name is Armstrong, some people, like Lance Armstrong, I'm realizing, feeling kind of old, because Lance Armstrong is kind of like behind, it was like before their time. I mean, when I'm talking to uh, people who were born in the year 2000, Sometimes I have to stop and think about that. Um, but you know, just try and think of. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm old at heart anyway. Um, I was a history major, so I do think of old things. Um, anyway, Ed 2000 does seem very recent to me. Um, but uh, right, just thinking of you know people. Sean White is another. He's a he's like snowboarding guy. But just trying to make helmets really cool and drive home that you know these sort of like idols of theirs wear them. Yeah. So we talked about helmet safety, and we talked about eyes, ears, mouth. And I'm going to quiz you guys later on, which is exactly what you should do to them. Um, right, so then uh, the, next, the next topic is talking about clothing, uh, and super simple, you know, we've got eyes, ears, mouth, we're going to have the ABC quick check later on, so just really easy things. For clothing, it's bright and tight. So, going back to the, uh, going back to the super cool <laughs> reflective safety vest. Now, you know, I hate it because I wear one of these all the time, but I know that even among my peers, certainly among people younger than me, uh, the reflective vest is just a really tough sell when you're like, you know, rolling up to some place like, God forbid it be a date or something, you know, and, uh, and you're wearing the, the safety vest. But, you know, if you're biking at night, and especially, you know, for, for young kids, I don't think, I personally don't think it's a good idea for them to bike at, at night. Um, just because, uh, just because uh, you know they're they're young, and you know, so like for a ten-year-old, you know, every parent has to make that decision for, for themselves. Um, but certainly, by the time you hit 13, 14, you're getting ready to go to high school. Uh, you're probably going to be out a little bit past dark. And so, um, there's this, which is the gold standard. It even has the reflective, the reflective straps. And I think this is, if somebody wants to read, I think I got this in Oregon for a bike walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bike walk. There we go. So one of the rich benefits of being in Oregon is that you're just tripping over bikes. Uh, bike giveaways. But Massachusetts is getting there. Uh, what I say is that you don't be a bike ninja. You know, like you don't get any awards for being unnoticed, unseen. I, you know, I tried to reference Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in one of my classes, and that just utterly didn't work. I mean, we're talking, talking like over a decade too, too early. I, in another one, I tried to, oh, so, Right, so I, you know, wearing a white T-shirt. Also, um, I know it's actually kind of nice that skinny jeans are in, like the tighter jeans. Because another time, I, I tried to reference MC Hammer as like, you know, you wouldn't want to wear big pants like uh, MC Hammer, and then totally blank. I mean, they had never. <laughs> I was, it was even worse than the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, but you know, I'll ask who here. I'm sure that all of you have gotten that grease stain, right? You know, right here, yeah. the grease stain. So bright and tight. You don't want you don't want uh, your pant leg to be flapping all over the place. It can actually be kind of dangerous if it gets caught in the caught in the gears. Um, so there's this wonderful strap that serves two purposes. It's reflective, and it will hold your pants. It'll keep them from from hitting the chain. 
Actually, uh, so I think we talked a little bit about the, um, the fitness challenge and the walk or ride day that's coming up. So I think this is at the same time, mid, mid May, the 17th, 18th? Same time as for Bay State Bike Week, which uh, we, in part, Mass Bike, in partnership with Mass DOT and Mass Rides, uh, we give out a lot of uh, giveaways, t-shirts, um, ankle bands. Uh, this year we have bells and stickers. And that hit a new logo. Looks much better than last year's. Um, so if you guys uh, just look at the baystatebikeweek.org website, and plan an event, you can actually get some, some ankle straps. Um, and uh, you know, I can give you that, that email address, or, or that uh, URL later on. Anyway, the point being, bright and tight. So you want, uh, you want something, uh, and actually by Massachusetts state law, does anybody happen to know what the state law is? I do, but that's because it's my job. I'm just curious if this is common knowledge in the least bit, okay. So this actually would not comply with state law. Game during daylight hours. I think it's, it's a, yeah. It's I think it's a, a half hour uh, before sundown, or is it after sundown? Yeah, because you have that sort of like residual light after sundown. I think it's half an hour after the sun officially sets that you have to have lights. But the official Massachusetts state law is a rear red reflector or light. Of course, a light is better than a reflector. A front white light. So since this is a reflector, it technically doesn't count. And in fact, I think a lot of bicycle um, shops will just uh, discard these lights, uh, sorry, these reflectors, because they don't technically comply with state law. Um, I mean, it's fine to have them, but they are not sufficient. Uh, and then something visible from the sides, so uh, wheel reflectors, oh, yeah, like that, or, uh, or a vest. So my bike doesn't have the spoke reflectors, but I do wear a vest. And then something uh, visible on the by your feet, such as these reflectors right here, or ankle straps. So actually, Massachusetts has one of the better state laws. Uh, I'm going to reference Oregon a lot because that was where I, uh, I earned my stripes. Uh, I was there for a few years. And their state law, I think, is just a front white light and a red rear reflector. I don't think they talk any about, uh, about any of the um, other reflective material. So sometimes, you know, when you're talking to kids, especially younger kids, I'll, I'll say like, and you guys don't want to get a ticket because if you thought your parents were mad when you had that grease stain, what happened if you come home with a $20 ticket? Of course, the reality is I don't actually know of anyone who's ever gotten a ticket for not having reflective material. If anybody has heard about that, I would actually be very curious. I'll give you my card. But, uh, you know, just thinking of other excuses to get them to, um, to, to light up because they are totally invisible otherwise. And actually, this goes for any any bicyclist. I, I, I just think it's so, like I would put it right up there with wearing a helmet if you're lighting after dark to have some sort of reflected material and, and lights. Um, okay, so we've talked about wearing a helmet properly. We've talked about bright and tight. Uh, do we have any questions before I move? We're going to get into some simple bike maintenance. Who here knows how to do simple things on bikes? Out of curiosity, does anybody like pump tires? Does everybody know how to yep. pump tires? Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, overhaul bottom bracket. Yeah. Actually, if anybody knew how to do that, that would be awesome. Um, but, uh, right, so this is where the ABC quick check comes in. And it's really great when I'm in middle schools because I, in the classrooms, it's something that I just totally forget about because I'm not in class, in elementary school classrooms very often, but they always have the print and cursive alphabets up uh, lining the, the walls, so I, I get to just point out and be like, what's that letter? It's awesome. And actually, just out of curiosity, I got made, so Gen Y, I got made fun of as a member of Gen Y for not writing in cursive. Is that like a common perception? Somebody was like, oh, I bet you don't even know how to write cursive. I was like, I do too. I was in one of those elementary school rooms with, you know, the cursive A. Anyway, I digress. Um, so the ABC quick check. Uh, does anybody have any idea what A you might stand for? All of these, all these letters correspond. Air. Air, that's right. So this is great because uh, Julie, without meaning to, gave me a great demonstration of tires that are too low. Ah. So 
weekend. This, Pump up the tire. Oh, yeah, we yeah. talk about. Gets yeah, but it's 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 great for demonstration purposes. Well, I like to say uh, it should feel like a basketball. Um, if you want to get even more, I mean, it should be pretty hard unless you're off-roading it, you know, going downhill, racer, you know, then you might really want to drop the tire pressure to get better grip. But uh, assuming that you're staying on pavement, which presumably all of these kids are more or less staying on the pavement. Um, you should probably have it up to whatever the uh, whatever the tire says. Like for example, this one is 40, 40 and 65 psi. Does anybody know what psi stands for? Pounds per square inch, right? Uh, so 40 to 65. I'll typically pump it up to 65 because in my mind, there's no reason not to go as high as possible your tires are going to slowly lose air no matter what, which is a demonstration of that. Uh, does anybody know why you want to have your tires pumped up high? You don't want low tires. So fast. Huh? Yeah, yeah, so there's less rolling resistance. That is one thing. Uh, the guy who taught me everything I know about working on bikes said the number one, what was that? Better gas mileage. Better gas mileage. <laughs> <laughs> I have a sticker on my bike that says uh, 40 miles per burrito. <laughs> I, really, I like that one. I don't know if I get quite 40 miles. But, um, no, you actually, uh, if you hit a bump or something, like uh, let's say you run into a curb, you'll get what's called a pinch flat. You'll, your, your tube will actually uh, get pinched between the concrete or the rock or whatever and the rim. And so it's this really uh, easily recognizable flat. It looks like a, it's called a snake bite because it's two holes. Uh, it's called a pinch flat. So not only do you get to go faster, but you also are less likely to get flats if you have a, a properly inflated tire. So we've got A. Uh, B, does anybody know what B might stand for? Brakes. Great. And it's interesting because I don't think I've gotten through one class. I mean, I've taught probably a dozen since coming to Massachusetts. And all of them in all grades, there's always at least one kid that, like, you know, gets all of the ABCs of this. So, um, so that's always very satisfying. People know more about bikes than they realize. But um, especially if you're just pulling a bike out of a closet, out of a garage, you know, starting to get kind of nice, you're like, oh my gosh, it's Bay State Bike Week. I got a bike everywhere this week, which I hope you do. Uh, what you do is you want to just test the brakes. You should be able to lock the wheel. So this is a fun one. Um, left, left hand, left brake corresponds to the front, the front wheel. And actually, this is, an this is also a demonstration of why you don't want to engage just the front brake, especially if you're going quickly. Some of you are nodding like you know what's going to happen. But notice how the wheel locked up. But if you're going forward, you're still going to keep moving. So uh, you, know, you want to make sure that there's some space between the, uh, the handle and the, the brake lever. And you, uh, you definitely want it to, to lock up because you want the brakes to work. So then, second test, you can drag the, the bike along and, um, and the, the rear wheel is seized. So super easy test. Uh, so we've got an A for air, B for brakes. This is why I use both my brakes. If for whatever reason I only have the front brake, like the rear brake is damaged or something, I just am really careful, especially when going quickly. You may know what C could stand for. And there are actually multiple potential answers. C? Chain. That's right. So, chain, cassette. The gears are also known as the cassette. This is the crank. Um, so, just sort of the, the whole drive train is what we call it. But anyway, uh, this actually looks to be in pretty good shape. You just want to make sure that it's, you know, clean, that, uh, oh, actually, there's one thing. This is going small gear to small gear. And typically you don't want to do that because you're flexing the chain out. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see, but uh, you're basically going from the furthest inside on the front to the furthest outside on the, on the rear. So that's just a, a little tip for anybody. Um, don't want to go big to big or small to small. But otherwise, you know, this, uh, this chain is looking, is looking great. Uh, if, one thing I like to say is if your chain breaks or is broken, it turns this wonderful device that allows a man to go as fast as a horse 
That was what, back in the late 1800s, bicycles were. It allows a man to go as fast as a horse, this wonderful device. It turns this wonderful mobility device into a 30-pound thing that you have to carry with you. Because without a chain, it's really difficult to go forward. So a rusty chain, you know, just get some tri-flow, drip it on, uh, you know, wipe off any excess grease. If the chain's broken, obviously get it fixed. And that's the, the, the key message in the ABC Quick Check is, especially for kids, if there's something wrong with the bike, go to somebody else and get it fixed. We don't want them trying to fix it themselves, especially when they're younger. Uh, you know, take it to an older sibling, take it to a parent, whatever. All right, so ABC Quick. The, uh, the Quick, actually, does anybody know what the Quick might be? Quick is Quick Release, which fortunately, this has a Quick Release. Um, it's this lever right here, and does this have lawyer tabs? Yeah, it does. Okay, so there, there are these, these little uh, tabs on the bottom. They're, they're nicknamed lawyer tabs because I guess the joke, it, even when that's not engaged, they will in a pinch keep your, your wheel on. But, um, uh, so that's why the wheel isn't falling off. It's especially dramatic when I'm, you know, just flip the quick release, lift the bike, and the wheel falls off. Um, but yeah, you want to make sure that with a quick release, I mean, obviously with bolts, uh, you know, make sure it's nice and tight. Uh, with a quick release, you want to center it, you want to close it, and then you should have a little indentation on the palm of your hand after you've closed it. So you want that on there nice and tight. And this is the, okay, this is the gruesome story that I usually reserve either for an especially um, distracted or absent group of kids, or uh, if somebody asks me generally about why it's important to do the uh, quick release. When I, I told you about the guy who taught me everything I know about bikes, he was explaining to us the importance of making sure that the front wheel is on really tight. And this is when I was, this is when I was putting my front wheel on, so I was listening intently. He had a friend who, he was actually, um, he had pulled his bike away from a bike rack, and his quick release had gotten caught on the adjacent bike and it flipped open. So he was biking along, hit a bump or something, and his, his front wheel just popped off. So if you can imagine what happens when up, you know, like sort of Sir Isaac Newton, a body in motion, the fork hits the ground and he, you know, the front end stops, he does, he does an endo, he goes over the handlebars and smashes out all of his teeth. And so that's like the gruesome story of why it's so important to make sure that your front wheel, and, and of course, it's so important to underscore how fun biking is and why it's actually much healthier to bike than to not bike. But assuming that you're going to bike, you want to do it right, and it's really important to make sure that especially the front wheel is on properly. Uh, the rear wheel, you do also want to be, uh, you want to have it on tight, um, but if it falls off, it's not quite as, you just sort of go, oh. You know, I mean, it's not it's not quite as uh, as dramatic, but um, yeah, just something something to keep in mind. So we've got an A, B, C, quick. Oh, and then there also there's a quick release right here as well um, by the by the seat. Does anybody know how when you're on a seat, when you're on a bike seat, you should be able to put your put your heel on the pedal and extend your leg all the way out. But you shouldn't have any flex, so that way when the ball of your foot is on the pedal, you get maximum. Efficiency. So in case anybody was curious about seat height, that typically means that you can't put your feet down while you're sitting on the seat. Anyway, moving on, uh, ABC quick and then check. The last thing is what I do, uh, what I call the drop test, or what is called the drop test. Ah, so I just heard a weird clacking noise. I'm like, what is that? Oh, it's just the chain. It's basically just picking up your bike, dropping it. I like to say, don't be afraid to be rough with your bike because any amount of uh, abuse that you give it in checking it out, you're only going to be giving more abuse to it when you're actually riding it. I, I mean, I haven't spent that much time on the Fall, uh, Fall River roads, but I know that roads in most of Eastern Massachusetts can be sort of, um, well, it's almost like mountain biking, actually. All the potholes, cracks. Um, okay, so ABC quick check. All right, I told you I was gonna quiz you. Uh, what? All right. What, are, what do you need to keep in mind when you're wearing a helmet? Just raise your hand or I'm going to single you out and call on Yes? The two finger rule. The two finger rule, that's great. So what's the, what is the, the shorthand is eyes. Eyes. 
You should also, do you remember what you need to see? Right, okay. very simple. I'm just gonna spend uh, a few minutes on it and then I'll take some questions. I might quiz you again on the ABC quick check. Um, rules of the road. So just sort of as a rule of thumb, does anybody have any ideas about rules for bicyclists versus say rules for cars, motorists, anyone? Any differences, sorry? Same rules apply, that's right. There are very few exceptions to uh, the rules for motorists and bicyclists. And because kids are getting driven around everywhere these days, they all already know the rules. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, I think, that um, instructors who are trying to promote bicycling face is the fact that so many adults completely ignore all traffic rules. I, I, you know, as a, as a, bicycle, a, a bicycle advocate, a person who bikes a lot, I said I bike to Brockton from, uh, from Boston, and I bike to Framingham also this weekend. Uh, you know, partially because it's just part of my job, partially because I think it's the safest thing to do. I do obey all traffic laws, but you know, you know kids when they see their parents, uh, their, you know, their mother or dad, you know, going through a red light or going the wrong way up a one-way street or, uh, what is, come on, anybody else think of some? Those are the really egregious ones, um, popping up. Uh, not yielding to pedestrians. Yeah. Not stopping. Not stopping. Right, right. Just this morning, my uh, my boss was saying that he saw some guy, uh, some uh, a bicyclist, almost hit a, a guy in a crosswalk with the walk sign on crutches. So, like, as if there was somebody who absolutely didn't need to get hit again. You know, this bicyclist almost hit him. Uh, so yeah, I mean that, that I think is a really tough thing. So, and it's also kind of puts me in a precarious position and maybe you guys have some ideas about this. It's like, well my dad, he never stops at stop signs or red lights. I mean, I, I don't want to say like, well your dad should. Kind of, I do want to say, well your dad should, but you know, you don't want to, you don't want to tell your, <laughs> the students to start lecturing their parents. I just say, well, you know, this is really the safest way to do it. Um, because, you know, you want to be predictable, you want to know that everybody else on the road knows what you're going to be doing. So, so that's the, the, I mean, that's the heart of it, and I'll typically, because I only have 35 to 40 minutes, say 45 minutes, um, you know, kids have to come and go, and then uh, reality is it's 30, 35 to 40 minutes at most. Um, I will try and get through the really basic ones, it's the very last thing, but, you know, I'll just say, coming up to a red light, you know, you're biking along, I'll even, like, I'll be out there on my imaginary bike, or if I'm, there we go, biking along, and then the light turns red, what do you do? Actually, you guys probably all know, you stop, right? Okay, so then the light turns green, what do you do? Aha! <laughs> yes, I was hoping that some brave person on Monday afternoon would say that. Because the kids will say that. And we, does anybody know what I'm going, because that's what I said when I, when I did this training, sorry. Look. Look, that's right, that's right. Because uh, what I'll say is, you're a bike driver. You're smarter than all of those other people on the, all of those other jokers on the road. And they might, I think there was one study at one intersection in Boston showing that motorists would go through red lights up to three seconds. One 1,000, yes. two 1,000, three 1,000. Three seconds is a really long time that they'll continue going through the red light. So it's really important to make sure, look, make sure the traffic is clear. And I'm just gonna say I bike every day to work. This winter I was really fortunate in being able to bike literally every day to work because it was so mild. And, uh, and I'll actually, I mean, I do the exact same thing. You know, stop the red light, make sure that there's no more traffic coming, and then I'll go. Okay, same thing, biking along, biking along. Oh, here comes the point of controversy in the, in the bicycling community, perhaps more divisive than any other controversy. I say, you want to turn left, what do you do? Just make the motion with me. Make the left turn. Everybody? Everybody? Can I get everybody? Okay. Going left. All right. So you're going right. You're like, oh, what do you do? All right. So, so this is it. This is the crux of the controversy. Do you guys know where this comes from? Do you, do you know where the, the, the left arm is? Oh, you learned it in your car. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's exactly it. Slow down or stop. Down here. Yep, and this is, yeah, that's exactly right. So then the question is, there are some people. I passed my driving <laughs> <laughs> There are some people 
who, I mean, it's just am amazing. You think of all the controversial is issues out there, and you get these long common threads about, no, 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 you should be using your right hand. You know, you should be doing this. I, so what I say is I prefer for kids to do this because it's more intuitive. It makes more sense. Uh, some people will say, oh yeah, but you can use your left hand because then your hand is on your right brake, which is the rear brake, which we just discussed, poses less of a problem. Also, um, people, so cars are passing on, the, on, on your left, and so your body might be blocking if you're, if you're pointing right. So this might make things easier for motorists. But this is the personal anecdote that is why I prefer this. I was biking along on the Southwest Corridor in Boston, if any of you know the area, and I was, uh, oh no, 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 I'm sorry, I was, I was still on the road, I wasn't on the bike path. I was on the road and I did this, and this woman pulls up to me in her minivan, and this isn't like rush hour, so it's a pretty hectic, hectic scene. She pulls up to me, she says, hey, she rolls up, hey, what's that mean? <laughs> I was like, uh, I mean, I'm turning right. She's like, oh. And then she, like, you know, starts to move back away. And then she, like, veers back towards me. And she's like, wait, how do you signal you're turning left? <laughs> you just do this. She's like, oh, okay. And so then she, like, sped on. Honestly, it was one of the more pleasant interactions. I was like, wow, I just taught you something. You know, like, I didn't just get honked at or, like, have a shoe thrown at me or whatever. Um, but, you know, this is, I think, a little bit less intuitive not just for kids, but for motorists, for, for everyone. So, talk about red light. Uh, oh, right, and the final thing, stop signs. Come up to a stop sign. Stop. It's not called a slow down going sign. Uh, and then, of course, make sure to look both ways. And you keep going. Um, just the last thing about road riding, or the last thing about rules of the road, uh, and we, we talk about this on the, on the handout, too. There are these two handouts, the, the sort of bright, multicolored one. Uh, oh, and this corresponds also to our Go By Bike brochures, which those are, those are more in-depth. I actually should have brought some with, with me, but I should think, too. Uh, it just goes over everything that I went over right now in a really concise way, rules the road. Uh, then there's a, a bicycling for parents guide. One of the questions is, well, one, why don't we teach children younger than 10 about bike safety? Is there any reason not to? So the National Safer uh, School Consortium, or coalition, coalition, I think, uh, they talk about sort of um, their cognitive studies showing that below the age of 10, uh, children have a, hard time with, a harder time with spatial relationships, and so it might actually be more dangerous to have them out on the roads biking. And also they have a harder time understanding sort of the social constructs surrounding rules and that you need to follow rules. And so those are two reasons. Also, the, the really big reason why is because the federal government, which pays for this program, by statute, you can't teach um, children outside of grades four through eight. So that's a really big reason. And then there are also supporting cognitive development reasons, which is probably why when they were figuring out the demographic to target, when they were doing legislation, they chose that. The second question is, should my child ride in the road? And that is a difficult question that I often will say, I'll just leave it up to the parents. You know, whatever they feel comfortable with, every road is different. What is it, president, president's ad? Yeah, like I probably wouldn't want a 10 year old biking in that road. Uh, you know, that's just, that's just me. But you know, uh, there are a lot of side streets, very residential side streets around here where it might be totally okay. You know, you're just going a few houses down, block down. So that's, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to touch on that because that'll occasionally come up, usually from parents or from teachers. Uh, so as I promised, I'm going to go really quickly over what kind of clothing kids should wear. It's bright and tight. That's how quickly I'm going to go over it. But um, instead of, so in addition, uh, uh, in addition to the awesome reflective vest, you know, what are some other things you can give? White t-shirt. I, I saw you mount it. <laughs> White t-shirt. Yeah. And then also, uh, you know, making sure that those are, uh, that your pant legs are, uh, are secure. And then just, oh, yeah. Why do you think a bike is made to make 
part of the framing wheels reflected as part of a state or a federal mandated law. So if a kid doesn't wear a vest, at least the bike is made that way. Is there any laws out there that bike makers have to, you know, you know you get the basic reflectors on there, but is there any state or federal laws that would help the bikers be seen better? Um, well, so uh, state, state law, as I said, they, they um, the bikes typically, so, yeah, bikes typically will come with these reflectors already on them. I know that I used to work in a shop where I was just sort of like putting together bikes right and left, you know, one one per hour. And for the really high-end road bikes, we'd usually throw the throw the uh, reflectors in a big box because if you're riding like a twelve hundred dollar road bike, then believe it or not, people get angry because it adds like three grams to their bike and they are so into the weight of the bike. But generally, um, bikes, especially kids' bikes, should have those reflectors. And you're right, according to state law, they don't have to wear, uh, wear vests if they have those, those wheel reflectors. Um, but it's still a good idea. The, I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the like, people who, uh, you know, they've got the light on the helmet, they've got two lights on the front, two lights on the back, they have the, the uh, leg bands that light up around the ankle. I mean, they're sort of like, um, or like a Christmas tree or something, you know, just like going down the road. And I actually think that's kind of awesome because nobody is going to miss them. Nobody's going to uh, not see them. Um, so uh, just really quickly, I'm going to go back over ABC Quick Check. Does everybody just want to say quickly? Air. That's, that's right. And an overall check. So it is about quarter to five right now. I said I would leave 15 minutes either for questions or for getting out and enjoying the 60 degree weather on a nice fall river. Um, so just to be clear, we're from Mass Bike, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. It's the statewide bike advocate.